Today I wanted to talk about a topic that has to do, well, with all of us, really, and it's that of nature. Now, when I say nature, a lot of things come to mind, including a scene kind of like this, right? You're out in the woods, you're in the nature, um, the great outdoors, that kind of thing. And what we're talking about today certainly affects nature and probably at its most observable uh, way, but it also affects us in a much grander way. Now, many of you know that I enjoy nature. I enjoy getting out, uh, fishing, hiking, hunting, that kind of stuff. And uh, I, I like to see nature and partake in it and observe animals and whatnot. And what I find is a lot of times when I get out into the woods, especially certain places that I, I really enjoy, like there's a couple pieces of land or where there's certain lakes or even certain parts of lakes, that I just really, I get a sense of enjoyment out of being there. And, and some places I can go and I know certain trees that I can climb up into kind of thing and, and just watch animals and, and I get a enjoyment out of that and a lot of time I can look at the the land and I can look at the creatures that go through and the kind of the scenicness of it right like when you're in Cape Breton or something you're in the highlands or when I was in Alberta and you go to the mountains and it kind of brings about this sense where I look at the scenery around me and I evaluate it and I, I say to myself you know this is good I like this I, I like being out here this is this is good and that statement there kind of, well not kind of, it reminds me it reminds me of god in in genesis he creates everything right so he creates the universe and the stars and he starts to form the planets and and then with the planet he rises the earth or like the landscape out and he divides the seas and then he creates you know life to flourish birds in the air uh, animals on the ground, fish in the sea, he creates the plant life. And when he's done creating all these things, he steps back and kind of evaluates it and says, uh, this is good. Sorry, mosquitoes are bugging me now. He says, this is good. And, and he he's declaring that it's good. And he's also evaluating that it's good. <laughs> the mosquitoes are actually going to add to this in a way. Um, and so I kind of reflect on that a little bit when I look at the nature around me and I think to myself, this is good. However, there's something we should note and something we should always remember is that the state that I'm referring to, when I look around the woods, when I'm going somewhere and, and, and I'm on a hike or I'm in a new land or I'm kayaking across a lake and I think this is good, it's different than the state that God was looking at when he said, this is good. Why do I say that? When we look at Genesis, we get this account before the fall, um, that childbirth, right? So if you look at the fall, Adam and Eve are there and they disobey God. They eat what they're not supposed to eat. And out of that, sin enters into the world. And then there's some changes to nature. So God says to them that uh, woman now in childbirth, it's going to cause pain. This tells us that previously to that, it would not have been a painful encounter to give birth to someone. Um, he says to the men that, you know, when you work the land, it's going to be hard work. It's going to hurt you. The, the thorns are going to cut you kind of thing. And it's going to take a lot of labor to grow this fruit, to grow your crop. If I wanted to turn this into a field and, and grow something, it would take quite a bit of work. It wasn't always that way. It was just that, uh, you know, you could eat of any plant except this one. And so now if, if you eat something, it could make you very sick. It could go very bad. Like you have to be cautious of what you eat and what you don't eat when it comes to, especially to wild plant life. So there's that. We, we can see that in Genesis that now it hurts to give birth. Now, now there is pain. There's death in the world. Before that wasn't the thing. That wasn't the case. And then also when we look forward into time, we can see that the state uh, then is also different. So at the start of time in the garden, the state of nature was different than it is now. When we look forward to the prophecies and in the book of Revelation and Isaiah uh, in particular, we can see a difference in the state of nature there. So for example, in Revelation chapter 21, it says, then I saw a new heaven or I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem coming down out of the heaven uh, from God prepared as a bride and adorned her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, this is the dwelling place of God. 
is with man, he will dwell with them and he will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore. The former things have passed away. And so that can tell us obviously that in that coming state, in that eternal state, there won't be pain, there won't be death, there won't be any of that stuff. But today, in the state that we are in, there is death. There is mourning. There is a reason for your tears. There's a reason for your suffering. It's, it exists in this nature, as it were. And then we can see even if you flash forward in Isaiah, once again in chapter 11, this prophecy of the, the new world that is to come. The prophet writes, The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf with the lion, and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. And so here you can see a contrast, and not a minor one, but quite a major one. Um, right now, <laughs> I have sprayed myself with bug spray. I have covered myself with a poison, uh, DEET, right? So that the mosquitoes will not bite me. And yet here they are still trying to find a spot where they can bite and hurt me and suck the blood out of me kind of thing. And, and we can see that and we know that and we expect that. Um, if you're going out into the wild, in, into nature to any degree, you bring bug spray for that reason or you bring a, a, a net that goes over your head to free you from, from the torturous mosquitoes or you just suffer. People might not like this one, but if you ever see a bear raiding a beaver's den to get the beavers, we might not like that. But at the end of the day, people like me respond and just say, well, that's nature. In fact, there's this statement of nature is cruel. Um, if you spend enough time out in nature, you'll see stuff. I've seen, you know, I've seen ospreys dive into water and grab fish out of it. I've seen an owl take a squirrel off of a, a tree stump. I've seen coyotes chasing deer and, and I've myself have been charged by a moose and I've encountered bears and all this stuff. And, and there's a sense of danger and risk that is involved in the outdoors when we encounter these wild animals. And yet in Isaiah, in the prophet's writings of what is to come, he writes about the leopard lying down with a goat that a bear and a fat cow will graze together in the same field, that, that uh, the lion will eat straw like an ox, and your child will just be out there among them, playing with them. And it's not something of, oh my goodness, like get little Jimmy away from that thing. It's just like, ah, it's cool. Everything's at peace. Everything's, it, it's a new nature. It's a different way that things go. And, uh, and that is where we come to this contrast of then and the past, and then, going forward into eternity versus now. The terms that I like to use when I talk about this is the intended nature. That is the nature that God created out of everything that is without sin, how it was intended to be. And then the cursed nature, the nature that we find ourselves in where you do have to worry about these things because sin has entered the world and, and now there is chaos, there is pain, there is suffering, there is death, and, and there is well, that nature, we have to be aware of that. Um, and animals eating other animals and us eating those animals um, is only one part of it. And really, it's, it's an easy part for us to understand, but it's actually a very minor part when we think about it, and when we think about the other areas that this affects us. What do I mean by that? Um, it, it's a hard concept to grasp, kind of. Um, However, let's use this example because it's, it's hard to get because it seems so bizarre, right? Like if you think about a grizzly bear next to a cow in a field and they're just eating grass together. If you think about a mosquito flying by you and landing on a flower and then sucking, sucking the nectar out of it. If you think about a child out there playing with a rattlesnake or you think about a wolf eating a squash, like this just seems bizarre and so weird and so foreign to us um, it, it, it seems like an impossibility mosquitoes 
However, let me explain it in a way that might help you understand. In Nova Scotia, at least in mainland Nova Scotia, it would be difficult for you to go for a long drive across the province without seeing something. In fact, if you were to walk through the woods, almost any woods in Nova Scotia, and you know what to look for, you would see signs of this animal. I would say out of the large animals, large land animals that we have in Nova Scotia, the white-tailed deer is probably the most popular, well, most populated animal that we have. They're everywhere, right? And you go in the woods and you can see the signs of, of their droppings or their hoof prints, or you can see in the fall where the bucks have been rubbing their antlers against the tree to scrape the velvet off and you can see that or you can see their beds and whatnot and, and you get this idea that they're there or you see them everywhere. So much so that uh, when, when people, you know, they plant a garden and the deer comes out of the woods and eats their garden and they complain about it. And people's response usually to that complaint is, well, they were here first. Have you heard that before? Maybe you've said that before. Uh, if so, uh, just know that you're wrong. <laughs> just know that that's actually not the case. White-tailed deer, uh, to some degree, were, or maybe are, I don't know, an invasive species. They're not from here. They're not naturally here. Um, when people first, when, anyways, European people first came to Canada, you can read these journals. I've read a number of them, uh, of the, the sailors, and as they would arrive, they would hire Aboriginal hunting guys to take them hunting. For what? For mainland moose and caribou. Nova Scotia had herds of caribou and a lot of moose that would graze. And then what happened is in 1890, uh, people released white-tailed deer in Digby. And then from the west coast, or not west coast, but from western Canada, uh, the deer migrated into this area. A parasite uh, that doesn't affect the deer, but did affect the caribou and the moose got into them and killed off a large portion of the caribou and moose population. And then forestry changes happen and fire changes happen and all this other stuff to change the environment. And now, well, the idea that caribou once roamed Nova Scotia is something most people don't know. The moose population's down and white-tailed deer are everywhere to the point that people respond that way where they'll say that statement of, well, they were here before us. No, not if you're talking species-wise, the human was here first. Um, but we have become so used to them, so accustomed to them, that we respond that way. A similar idea would be if you go fishing in Nova Scotia. I myself primarily fish for bass. I, I really enjoy bass fishing. Um, you'll catch a fish that's very toothy. It's called a pickerel. Uh, it's a lot like a pike, smaller. Um, and fisher or anglers here, fishermen, fisherwomen, anglers uh, here, a lot of them have a hatred towards this animal because it's invasive. It gets into a lake and it kills everything else. It'll kill all the trout in the lake and it'll become the king of that waterway. And, and once it gets in a water system, I mean, you can do what you, you can try to slow it down. But at that point, the game's really over. It's going to get into every lake and every water system that is on that waterway. And it's aggressive and it will take over and it will eat the other fish. But here's something to think about. In 200 years from now, um, people are probably just going to assume pickerel. They're going to go fishing for pickerel. And it's going to be like pike fishing. That It's just what they do. Um, because as time goes on, people just get used to what is around them. And they assume that that is the natural state. At a much more important scale than what animal we have roaming our woods and what fish we have in our lakes is the state of our soul. Is the state of, of how we are before God. And we have been so entrenched in sin, in sinful ways, um, that we look at it and, and we assume, well, this is natural. People actually have this response to sin, to, to sinful things. They say something, one of three things. They say, well, everyone's doing it. It's common, right? Everyone's doing it. Or, or they feel that it's a part of who they are. Well, I was born this way. Um, I forget what my third one was, um, but, but there's that idea that uh, they justify it with, it's my nature, I was born this way, and everyone does it. Those first two are kind of the same. Um, but that actually doesn't justify it, right? That just explains it. That explains why you and other people are okay with it, but it actually doesn't change the nature of things, right? Um, it, it doesn't change the fact that it is of a cursed nature that we do these things, not the intended nature. And so we need to be aware of that. Uh, so when you encounter in your own life and you think to yourself, 
I'm doing this thing that everyone does. That doesn't make it okay. Or you say to yourself, I'm going after this thing or I have this thought or this attitude about me and I always have had it. That doesn't make it okay. You can even say to yourself, I was born this way. It's part of who I am. It's part of my identity. It's natural to me. It doesn't make it okay. When I look at my own life, I can see that I'm a person who is naturally selfish. I'm naturally unpatient. I'm naturally a bunch of other things. And uh, that doesn't make those things okay. In fact, the Bible often talks about this idea. Even the psalmist wrote, you know, Lord created me a clean heart. And, and the Bible talks about renewing ourselves. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, it says, uh, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Due to their hardness of hearts, they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit in your minds and to put on the new self created in the likeness of God in the true righteousness and holiness. And so what we need to ask ourselves when we are looking at our life, when we are evaluating ourselves, or when we find ourselves in the middle of something and we pause and be like, is this right? Well, you don't need to ask yourself, is, is this natural? You need to ask yourself, is this righteous? Is this honoring God? Is this how he wanted me to be? It's not a matter of is it, is it accepted or is it normal or is it in my nature? No, as Christians, we are putting off our own old nature and we are adopting a nature of a kingdom that is yet to come. And we are saying, I want to be the way that God wants me to be. I want to get back to the point, not like this, where I can walk through here and then get you know, mosquitoes biting me. If, if we're using the woods almost as a metaphor for one's heart, where I walk through my heart and the mosquitoes bite me and the tick tries to grab onto me ugh, and, and the bear will chase me and, and the thorn will dig into me. You know, that's natural, but it's harmful. With our heart, it's not a matter of being natural. It's a matter of being the way that God wants us to be, a renewed, a a new creature, a new life that we pursue that and honor God in all that we do. I hope that's an encouragement to you today. And I hope that in, in your daily living, in everything that you do, you go after your intended nature, not your cursed nature.